Kajala Medical presents COVID-19 The Answers, the show that delivers the scientific evidence-based knowledge that can safely return us all to our pre-COVID lives. My name is Dr. Fumi Okanola and I'll be hosting the show. Every week you can listen to me interview a highly respected professional about the science that can reduce your risk of becoming infected with this coronavirus. Right. Um, hello, listeners, and welcome to COVID-19, The Answers, and our episode SARS-CoV-2 is Airborne, Part 1. I'd like to introduce you all to Professor Jose Jimenez, PhD. Professor Jimenez is a Distinguished Professor and Institute Fellow for the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Scientists, uh, Sciences at the University of Colorado at Boulder in the USA. Professor Jimenez has been awarded the honor of most highly cited researcher from 2014 to 2019, recognizing him as being one of the world's most influential researchers of the past decade. With his research ranking in the top 1% by citations for field and year in the web of science. With over 20 years of research experience in aerosols, he is in the top 10 most knowledgeable environmental scientists in the world on this subject matter, which has led him to research the transmission of disease during this pandemic. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So, Jose, I'm curious, what led a mechanical engineer into the world of environmental science? Um. <clears throat> Well, I, I was interested in that. I was um, studying engineering as, a, as an undergrad in Spain and not being too sure about what to do, you know, once, once I graduated. But then I, I was worried about environment and pollution and climate change. And I, I realized that there were things I could do about it. So I started working in, in, in that area and that, that brought me to aerosols and to mass spectrometers. And, you know, once you know about aerosols, then you understand or you can help with disease transmission. And that's why we're talking today. Fantastic. So I'm going to get right into the questions. So Jose, you were, attributed, were a contributor to a paper entitled 10 Scientific Reasons in Support of Airborne Transmission of SARS-CoV-2, published in May 2021 in The Lancet, and to another paper, Airborne Transmission of Respiratory Viruses, published in Science in August 2021, on which most of my questions are based upon. I strongly advise the audience to read these papers as they are very understandable. We will provide links to them in the show notes. So, to limit transmission, we have largely been told to keep a six foot distance, wash our hands and wear a mask. We have been informed by public health that the coronavirus is spread through respiratory droplets and surface or fomite transmission. What is your definition of our title, SARS-CoV-2 is airborne? Okay. So indeed, we, we were told, especially at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020, that the virus was spread in one or two ways. We were touching some, someone's hand or a surface, like a door handle where the virus was, and then touching the inside of our eyes, the inside of our nose, or the inside of our mouth, and that's how we were getting infected. Or it was these, these large droplets, these projectiles that we are talking to someone and then they cough or they talk very excitedly and these projectiles fly through the air and again, they can hit you inside the eyes, inside the nostrils, inside the mouth. And if they don't hit you and they miss you, then they fall to the ground very quickly, right? And that's why if you kept six feet, that was safe, right? Now, that's what we were told and we were all, you know, disinfecting our groceries or, or whatnot. Now, you know, two years into the pandemic, we know that was wrong, that was erroneous. Those two ways of transmission, they can happen, but they are minor. There is one major way of transmission, which is we're breathing the virus in when inhaling it. You can only, and anything you can breathe in, this is basic physics, doesn't fall to the ground very quickly because if it falls to the ground very quickly, it falls so quickly that you can pull it up basically with, by, by breathing, right? So it's really this, this transmission through the air that we call airborne is the main mode of transmission. So th this is really a huge change um, in the pandemic. And it has been, I mean, scientifically it's clear and it's been clear since really August of 2020, I would say, but you know, it hasn't been accepted everywhere. And, you know, but, but that's more sociological or political reasons than, than scientific ones. Thank you. So I'm going to get right down to bare bones here. 
Can you please explain the difference between a droplet and an aerosol? In addition, please provide your opinion on the controversy in the scientific world on what size of tiny droplet constitutes an aerosol and why this is important. Mm -hmm. So basically droplets and aerosols are the same at some level. They are both balls of saliva or respiratory fluid that are in the air, right? If we are infected with COVID, the virus can be in our saliva or can be in our respiratory fluid, which is the liquid that wets the inside of our nose, our trachea, our bronchi, right? And if the virus is there and we expel a little ball of this uh, fluid, the saliva or the respiratory fluid, it can have some virus. And if that virus gets to someone, that's how you can get infected, right? The difference is the size and the behavior in the real world. Mm, I mean, in a way, you can say we could call them the big ones and the small ones, and then maybe that would be easier to understand. But in this field, the big ones are traditionally called droplets, and the small ones are called aerosols, right? And they behave differently. A droplet, like I was saying earlier, is two people are talking, and then one of them coughs or talks very excitedly or yells. And there are these projectiles that you can see, actually, with the right light, that fly through the air very quickly, and then they, they land somewhere, right? And those are the droplets, that's the droplet behavior. Now the aerosol is different. The aerosols are much, much smaller and they behave differently. And the typical aerosol that we, we used to explain is cigarette smoke. And then, you know, someone exhales cigarette smoke and it doesn't fall to the ground and it's not a projectile, right? It, at the beginning, you exhale it with a certain force, but then it stops, the friction of the air stops it and it's kind of there in front of the smoker, right? And then it may, it may go up, it may go to the side, it may stay there. It depends what the air is doing. It follows the air, right? Mm. And, and again, the, the droplets infect by impacting the aerosols by inhaling, right? Now, so there is the, I'm telling you, there is the big and the small, but can we put numbers into this? How big is big, how small is small? So in this domain, we talk in microns. A micron is a millionth of a meter, you know, um, the virus is a tenth of a micron, a bacteria is a micron, a human hair is a hundred microns. That gives you some, the diameter of a human hair is about a hundred microns, right? So a hundred microns you can see already, but you can see the thickness of a hair. A micron is too small to see, right? So now the question is, when do, you know, these, these things that, uh, these balls of saliva and respiratory fluid, when do they behave like projectiles? And when do they behave like smoke, right? Where is that dividing line, right? So there has been a long standing error and, and WHO still, their latest scientific brief still contains this long standing error, which says that basically it's five microns. That's the difference between, which would be the size of a big bacteria. That's the difference between a projectile and smoke, right? Mm -hmm. Now that is absurd. We have known, you know, really for a hundred years that is a hundred microns, 20 times larger and 8,000 times in mass. This is not a small error. This is an enormous error. And why do we know, for example, because of rain, you know, we have the weather predictions and, and the meteorologists know very well that the droplets in the atmosphere, if they are, if they are 100 microns or larger, they, they rain basically. If they are 10 or 20 microns, they don't, you know. And for example, one of the categories of, of, of pollution that, that is regulated by the, for example, by the US EPA in the US or by other environmental agencies in other countries is what we call PM10, which are particles of, with a diameter of 10 microns. And, and those float in the air, you know, and, and, and that's a pollution. If they fell to the ground, you wouldn't need to measure them or regulate them because they would fall to the ground wherever they, they get lifted in the air, right? So, so that has been a long standing error. And um, where, where the error comes from, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll, uh, should I go into that now or, or that, because that, that joins with the history. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think I'm going to ask you a bit later, but I'm happy for you to go into it now if you want. Okay, okay. So then um, this, this thing of the five microns is an error that dates from the 1960s and, and we were very puzzled by it. And it was really during the pandemic working with um, Katie Randall and Lindsay Marr and Lydia Buraiba. Tom Ewing, uh, as a couple of historians and a couple of aerosol scientists that we, we just were so curious that we started investigating, why do they say five microns? Where does this come from, right? And it, it turns out that um, during most of the 20th century, 
it was just denied that any disease went through the earth. Hmm. So that was something, you know, someone very influential in 1910 said, this is almost impossible, you know, and, and that was accepted. So then in, the in 1962, actually, there is a demonstration that tuberculosis is airborne. You know, they, they put some guinea pigs. So they take the air from a hospital where there is tuberculosis patients, humans that have tuberculosis, and they take the air out of there and they direct it to some cages with guinea pigs. And they see that they get infected with tuberculosis, but they had another set of guinea pigs and the air was disinfected with UV light and those don't get infected. So that was so clear after many years of trying that nobody could argue with that. The only way those guinea pigs got infected is because the tuberculosis bacillum was in the air. So then it was accepted. And then there was a period of time of about, about 20 years until the 1980s, that really tuberculosis was the only important disease that was thought to be airborne, right? And people knew that to get infected by tuberculosis, these aerosols that you need to inhale um, need to be smaller than five microns. That is for a specific reason for tuberculosis because uh, the, the tuberculosis bacterium needs to infect a cell, it's called the alveolar macrophage, it's, it's something that's on your alveoli, on your very deep lung. So this needs to be, you know, if you breathe it in and it sticks to your nose, you don't get infected. It really needs to get to the deepest part of the lung. And for that, it needs to be smaller than five microns because bigger, you know, the bigger the, these balls are, the clumsier they are. And as they start to go through your nose, whatever, they end up sticking somewhere and they cannot take the turns basically. But the small ones can, they follow the air better. And that's, you know, so then it seems that in the CDC, someone in the 1960s, got confused and, and confused, you know, the, the droplets that fell to the ground in one to two meters with, with the aerosols that have to go deep in the lung, which are the, the five microns versus the hundred microns, right? Now, th this is an enormous error and, and it had been pointed out by aerosol scientists multiple times, yet infectious disease doctors had not listened. And, and the committee that put together this scientific brief uh, for WHO, which is the Infection Prevention and Control Committee, you know, was established by WHO because there was a new disease, COVID-19, so they established a committee to see how it was transmitted and how we could protect ourselves, right? Now, that committee had six experts on hand washing, but it had zero experts on aerosols or urban transmission, which is, which is shocking, but it, it still reflects that bias that, that it was believed by that community that urban transmission was almost impossible. And that you know, COVID was definitely not airborne. Therefore, you didn't need to have anyone. So they didn't have anyone in the committee that could remind them that this was a, a known error. I see. So I think from from what you're saying, um, someone made an error back in the 1960s or before that. It's been incorporated into textbooks, probably of learning, and become a medical dogma. So something that people believe is correct when it isn't, as you're saying. And then that's led on to, uh, you know, an erroneous um, belief. So, um, so uh, what is the size of a SARS-CoV-2 virus? Um, so the, the virus itself is very small. So it's, it's 0.1 microns. And, and the, the typical aerosol, we think maybe a micron or two microns. And remember that the volume of a, of a sphere goes with the cube of the diameter, right? So if you have a one micron, one micron aerosol and you have one virus in there, the virus is 0.1% of the volume, right? So the, which is what we think is going on that mostly, you know, we don't expel naked virus into the air as some, some people imagine. What we expel is little balls of saliva and then there may be a few viruses sprinkled in there. But most of the ball, the aerosol or the droplet is saliva or respiratory fluid, which is, you know, mucin, mucus, sodium chloride, and water, you know, things like that. And then there is a few viruses sprinkled in there. And that's important when you think about masks, something like that. Some people say things like, oh, the holes in the mask are bigger than the virus. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't mean anything, right? Because you are not trying to stop the virus. You are trying to stop much bigger balls of saliva or respiratory fluid. So why is it important that an aerosol is considered to be up to 100 micrometers? rather than less than the less than five is, is it that we're producing lots of different sizes up to 100 micrometers that act differently and 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 then we're, we're getting infected and that's not properly considered is that is that what's happening well the the um, 
I would say that these are this is a, an, an important error, but it's not the more the most important. I would say, but but the um, the significance is that and uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci here in the U.S. Um, acknowledged that this was an error. I think it was in September of 2020. He was basically some other scientists, some of my colleagues uh, like Kim Prather, Don Milton, Lynn Simar reached out to him. And they talked to him and they explained to him that this was an error. And he acknowledged that he gave a lecture at Harvard and he said, you know, they explained to me and I believe them, it's, it's an error. We thought for all these years that it was five microns, it is not. And then he said, there are many more aerosols than we thought. Because now there is all these things that we expelled that we thought they, they were projectiles and they are not projectiles. So there are many more aerosols than they thought. And that also means whatever they thought was a droplet is no longer a droplet. There are many fewer droplets than they thought. Right, so you shift, you know, the 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 weight, and, and and now we know that basically for every one droplet we may expel, we expel a thousand aerosols, and that one that one droplet has one chance, you know, either the, it hits you in these relatively small objectives, right? It has to hit you inside the eye when you're not blinking, inside the nostril there, but even the droplet is coming down, and the nostril is pulling down probably for evolutionary reasons, so stuff doesn't fall in there. So that's very difficult or in the mouth when it's open, right? So, so this droplet has one chance at hitting something very small at you know half a meter to a meter distance is typically what people talk at. And then the aerosol is like the smoke. You exhale it and it's floating there and it's floating there and it's floating there and, and you're constantly breathing and breathing and breathing and you're gonna have really thousands of times more chance to breathe a virus that's in an aerosol than a virus that happens to be in that one projectile, right? Yeah, that makes it really clear now. So, of course, because we didn't consider or, or, or properly understand that there were so many aerosols being produced, we didn't implement the proper protections that we should have um, to pre prevent people from getting infected with the virus, with the coronavirus. So um, am I correct in that? Yeah, I mean, there is one one nuance here. Let me let me try to explain. So I would say when I was saying that um, there are two errors and one error, I would say there's one that's more important in the big picture and one that's less important. The, the more important one is, is what we call the droplet dogma, which, which really is the belief that a disease that's transmitted most when people are close and then people keep more distance, there's less transmission, that that's a droplet disease and is transmitted by these projectiles, right? And, and the reason why transmission decreases with distance is because the droplets fall to the ground. That's that's the droplet dogma. Then exactly what size the droplets, I would say that's a secondary thing. It is, I mean, it's important for the reasons we have discussed. It's also important because it reveals the deep ignorance in this field about aerosols, right? Mm -hmm. It was something they thought doesn't infect, so therefore they didn't study. And you assemble a committee of top scientists by WHO who are experts on disease transmission, nobody in that committee understands the physics. Right, so, so that is, is useful and nobody at WHO either. You know, none of the WHO personnel who oversaw the committee who work on that report saw that error. You know, I, the, the second I heard it, I was like, what? What are they saying? You know, immediately for me, if I had been in the committee, I would, I would say like, you cannot publish, this is an error, right? But there was nobody, you know? So I think that's the, that's some of the significance of the five micron error, but, but the other error is more significant because because basically um, it was, so it was Charles Chapin was this epidemiologist in 1910 who, who said that, you know, that we, we, we have empirical evidence by then, you know, from the times of the plague or, or um, other diseases that, uh, that basically distance helped or the, the Crimean war, that distance helped. If, if you have more distance, respiratory diseases are transmitted less. And you know, it was there was a possibility that it was because of the error, because of these droplets that fall to the ground. And this person said it is because of the droplets that fall to the ground. And this really became a dogma, and it's something people learn in textbooks, you know, in, in the medical field, in the infection prevention field, and they never questioned it, and they never studied the details of the physics or whatever because because they knew, right? And they have many important things to study. The, the way you're going to study something that that everybody knows is that way, right? So now, now the problem is that that's an error. That you know, if if something is transmitted less with distance, you know, the fact that something that that's gravity basically that something is falling to the ground is one hypothesis. It's plausible if, they, if these things exist and they fall to the ground, you would see that this is decreases with distance. 
But there is another possibility. If you, if you take more distance, let's say from a smoker, you know, you breathe less and less smoke, right? Because the smoke is more concentrated in front of the person. As you keep more distance, you breathe less, right? And, and that's also a plausible hypothesis, right? So airborne transmission can also explain uh, the decrease of transmission with distance. But then if, it, if it's these droplets that fall to the ground, if you are beyond two meters, or whatever, you are completely safe, right? The, the projectiles are not gonna make it. But now if it goes in the air, then in a poorly ventilated location, you could have a super spreading event like we've seen in choirs and restaurants and whatever. It's less likely than getting infected when you are close because when you are close, you are inhaling the most smoke, right? But if you're in a room, which is a box that traps the smoke or in a car or whatever, and you're not ventilating, the smoke accumulates this invisible smoke that has the virus, that's a respiratory aerosols, and you can get infected. And that's what we see. So basically, the, for 110 years, the medical field confused gravity with the real explanation, which is dilution, mm -hmm. right? So, they, so it's, it's an error in the physics. They misunderstood the physical mechanism, but these are people who are not physicists, don't study physics, that's not what they do. And in fact, the methods of physics are very foreign to them. You know, they think in terms of clinical trials and different things, and that's not how, you know, that's a very rudimentary approach compared to what we can use in physics because, because physics is less complex than biology, you know. So, so that is the really, the really major error that there was, and there was, I mean, and there, I don't see other way to say that there was this fundamentalism about droplets. I mean, there was a dogma and, and and there is people, and, and some of the most fundamentalist people were people like Bonnie Henry in, in British Columbia, where I think you are, or, or you know, in, in some places in Canada, I would say it's the hotbed of, of droplet fundamentalism. And it's, it's like, you know, the, and also it's associated with one other thing that is, you know, they keep asserting that they are right and they are droplets or whatever in the face of evidence, of overwhelming scientific evidence. But of course, if you say, we are the authority, you are not. So you set up a, what, what I call medical supremacy. You know, it's like, you know, we're doctors because these are disease, we are above you, physicists, there are scientists, and we get to, to say what the truth is, and you don't have a seat at the table. And we get to say what's acceptable evidence, and your evidence is not acceptable, right? And, you know, if you set it up like that, and those are the people that control public health agencies, you know, you, I can give all the interviews I want, I can write all the papers in science or, or the Lancet that I want, but if they say this is not valid, this is invalid evidence, Jose doesn't have the qualifications to have an opinion on this, then, then there you are, right? And that's, but I would say that's not science, that's, that's sociology of science, you know, at that point. Well, on this program, we, we, this is evidence-based. We believe that you, we know that you have the evidence and, and, and that's why this series has been created to give a voice to the people like yourselves um, to tell the truth about what's happening. I think it's astonishing that environmental scientists, people that were experts on aerosol transmission were not included on the World Health Body. I think it's astonishing that in the face of all of the evidence that's been released, that's there uh, uh, as plain on, uh, as your face and mine, um, that there's this, this intransigent dogma held about dro droplet theory and, and the non-acceptance of SARS-CoV-2 being airborne. So the, the whole point of our episode today is to explore um, uh, your papers and, and show the world because, you know, the, the general public, the evidence that's out there really, and they will hopefully demand for change because, because this hasn't been adopted. We're not getting the protections that we need um, we're not getting our air filtered. We're not being proper thing. Uh, you know, the air isn't properly ventilated and we're continuing to get infected with SARS-CoV-2, which is dangerous as you know, but, um, I'll move on now. Um, so, um, thank you for those excellent explanations, um, which transgressed several questions that I was going to ask. So, um, just to sort of, um, there, there, there is, sorry. There is, there is one thing that could naturally come now, but maybe it's coming later, which is try to explain why are the protections not being implemented, but maybe I could explain that now, I can explain later whenever you want. Mm, yeah, I, I, I think I'll come back to that because I suspect it's going to be a political answer, am I correct? Yeah. Um, <laughs> mix of answers. So, um, 
Talking, shouting, laughing, singing are basic activities we perform every day. Can you please explain to the audience how these activities cause the formation of aerosols and by what degree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, very important what, what you just said. We, we produce aerosols or many of us produce aerosols used when briefing, but we really produce many more when we talk, when we shout, when we sing, um, also when we cough or when we sneeze. Um, and what is an aerosol? So we said it's a little ball of the saliva or respiratory fluid. So we are, you know, our cavities are wet with these fluids and they have to come out. So it's, it's when the air comes out, when there are jets of air, for example, in the mouth, they say a pee, pee. And you can already see that if you have any saliva on your lips, pee, that jet of air going over your lip may take some of it and make little balls of aerosol, right? So it's basically that shear force we call that you have a surface that's wet and there is, the air is going by very quickly and it can pick up a little bit of, of, that, uh, of that liquid and then it can exit in, in, into the air. Now, we, we do know, you know, there is very strong evidence in the pandemic that vocalization, so talking or shouting, whatever, is strongly associated with transmission, right? I mean, there is many outbreaks in choirs. There are docents and we wrote a paper in one, but there is used many, many outbreaks. But to my knowledge, there is no outbreaks that I know of in a library or in a movie theater where people are quiet, right? So it's very clear. And, and there is also many outbreaks in bars where people are, are shouting because the music is loud. So it, it's, it's very clear. And I think anyone disputes that. Vocalization increases transmission. And now vocalization results in producing many more aerosols through these mechanisms, right? Sometimes it's your vocal falls you know, how we, how we generate the noises, basically. So the air is rushing out of us and it goes through the surfaces that, that, um, that move and that's how we, how we make some of the sounds, right? And those surfaces, the vocal folds are wet, basically in, in this saliva and then they, it can, um, some of these can be picked up and come out of an aerosol. There is also other processes in our lungs. Basically we have something that is like, like bubble formation, you know, or, so we have like a bronchi, which is like a tube, and you can think the tube collapses when we exhale, and then both sides are wet. So now when it opens up, you have a formation like a bubble, like one of the kids' bubbles, just a film. And then as you open up, that film breaks like the bubble, and, and you know, the material that was in that, that bubble surface, now it's an aerosol and it can come out, right? And, and that fluid could have the virus, right? So there, there are different ways in which, in which we produce aerosols. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, WHO and other public health agencies said, oh, that's not really a concern. What's of concern is aerosol generating procedures in the hospital, which is like when when do intubation or, or different procedures in which basically they put oxygen or they, that are pretty aggressive with your respiratory system. And say, in those cases, we can produce aerosols. That comes from the first SARS, there were some cases, it wasn't very clear, but it's something that again became a little bit of a dogma. They, they, were, they were sure that you could make aerosols in those cases, right? Now, during this pandemic, that hasn't been investigated in a lot more detail. And actually what we see is that those procedures actually don't make aerosols. It's not intubation that make aerosols, for example. It, they, when you extubate, so when someone who has been intubated and you remove uh, that system, then we tend to cough, and it's the coughing that makes aerosols, right? So, so that so that was also wrong, but it's something you know, and it was you know, once aerosol scientists started doing the measurements, it was obvious. But again, this was something that the doctors had concluded based on patterns of transmission with SARS, and it hadn't really been investigated properly, I should say. Right. Okay. And so, from what. I've gathered from what you said today and, 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 and also your papers is that breathing produces a certain amount of aerosols, talking even more and shouting and laughing even more again. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and by a lot. I mean, and there are different numbers in, in, the, in the literature, but some typical numbers would be like maybe breathing, you produce a certain amount and talking maybe 10 times less. And the louder the talk, the more, the more you produce. And if you are shouting or singing, maybe it's 50 times more, right? So this, this, you know, so you can see how in a choir where you have 
you know, lots of people singing, you really have 50 times the chance of having an outbreak than in the library, you know, and, and on top of that, in the library, normally you have less density of people and, and people are breathing less air. So yeah, so the, the, the difference is, is very large. And as I said, that's, that's really not, not disputed that, um, that the, the louder we, we produce sounds, the, the more aerosols we produce and the more outbreaks we see. And obviously that's critical for the public to know um, so that they can protect themselves, so that they know if they're talking in, a, in an enclosed environment and there's many of them talking, then if they knew that, then they'd be aware that they should limit themselves to those environments so that they limit the amount of time that they're infected. The yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's very important to, to explain, and there are different ways people can adapt, right? There is, some people would like to use the brute force, force approach. I have a colleague uh, from Finland, I think, he, and he said, you know, we should tell everybody not to talk for a month, and then the virus would go away. <laughs> and I, I told him, I agree that would work. Now, that's, this, that, that has no chance. I mean, it will work for the virus, but there's no chance. I mean, we will have a revolution if you tell people not to talk. But, but there are other smarter things that we can do. And there is, for example, in the subway in Mexico City or in Barcelona in some places, they have signs that say, please don't talk um, in public transportation to reduce transmission. Please type on your phone, you know, do SMS or whatever, don't talk on the phone. And people have been following that. And that, that's something very helpful in that moment that you're in a box. You can also explain to people is like, for example, you're working in an office and some of the time you're quiet working in your computer and some of the time you have to talk to other people. So when you have to talk to the people, go outdoors if you can, mm. right? And then you're making the unsafe part. You are doing it outdoors, which is a much safer location. And then the part that's safer, oh, something else is like, you know, because we exhale many more virus when we're talking, if we're gonna talk, if we're in a situation or in a, like, like now maybe where you are not wearing a mask all the time, when you should put it on is when you talk, right? Or when you're gonna sing whatever, which is the opposite that a lot of politicians and people have been doing during the pandemic. You know, we see people on TV constantly, they have the mask and then they're gonna talk and they remove the mask, giving the completely wrong example. You know, that's when they should put it in. You know, there is, there is actually the public health department, I believe is in Santa Clara County in California and they always do the briefings with the mask. And I like, oh, this, these people really understand what's uh, what, what's going on. They're giving the right example, but, but yeah. They, so there are many of these things that are not, they don't cost any money mm. or they are, you know, and, and they are not that difficult and, and they would reduce transmission a lot, but they haven't been explained, you know, because for the reasons we, we already discussed. Well, that's why this program's here. And, and, you know, thank you for that fantastic answer. Knowledge is power is what I say. Um, so, um, aerosol production is affected by other, uh, different factors such as different phases of infection, different sizes of human, for example, a child versus an adult, larger body mass index, to name a few. Can you please explain the different variations in aerosol production and what this means in terms of transmission? Um, <clears throat> so that is not very well known. I mean, the, the, the parameters that you have mentioned have been observed to, to change aerosol production. So it, it's clear that kids in average children produce less aerosols, but they still produce some. There was a paper out of MIT where they saw obese people or people who had lung disease seem to produce more aerosols, but the overarching factors, there is huge variability. You take 10 people my age and, and gender and whatever, or you take 10 obese people or you take 10 children and they vary factors of, of a thousand in how many aerosols they produce for reasons we don't fully understand. And we also know in the course of the disease, because at the end the disease is changing the properties of your respiratory fluid and, and there are mechanical properties like the viscosity that are very important or, or if it's more dry or less dry or, or you produce more mucus. So that's changing how many aerosols we produce. So this, this is something where there is a lot of research and there are a lot of results, but it's not well understood. I mean, at the end, um, I think they, we have to use the precautionary principle. I cannot, you know, if, if I could tell you, well, it's, it's people from Spain between 45 and 55 year old that are the highest of producers, then you could, you know, keep, you know, but, but there is nothing, there's no recipe I can tell you is people who, who are blonde or whatever that, that are the highest of producers. It can be anybody, right? Based on what we know. And also anybody can be infected and be contagious during this pre-symptomatic phase, right? Mm. 
So, so you kind of have to assume during periods that there's a lot of people infected that anyone you're with could be infected, right? Even if they're vaccinated, even if they already had COVID, we are seeing people who had Omicron and they're getting infected again pretty quickly. So, you know, so you just assume that, uh, that the people you are with indoors could be infected and then you protect yourself. You ventilate, you wear a mask or whatever, depending on, on you know, the, how many cases there are, the level of precaution that you, or the level of risk you're, you're willing to accept. And yeah, there's no, there is no, um, rule I, we, we can give, you know, that, that, that is, with this type of people is, is always safe or this type of people are really dangerous. Mm, okay. Um, when reading um, your research, I found the variables that affect aerosols particularly interesting. On the one hand, the size, physical and chemical properties of an aerosol influence where the virus can go and what it can do. Yet another factor that adds additional variability is the external temperature and weather condition, specific to the aerosol's location. In other words, a cold, hot or humid external environment also has an impact. Can you please explain these variable effects and why they are important? Um, so again, this is an area of research um, and there are some, there's something that's known and some stuff that's contradictory between different researchers, but it's clear that, um, you know, temperature, like, like with our food, that's why we put food in the fridge, you know, cold um, keeps, preserves biological uh, things like viruses. And, and that's what they do in a virology lab. They have freezers and that's how they preserve the virus and, and heat destroys it faster, right? Now, this is not a very big effect, right? I mean, in, in uh, it may have played a role, for example, there were these meatpacking plant outbreaks and, and those, those places are really, are really cold. They're often at 10 degrees C or 50 degree F just so that you preserve the meat. And, and then the, the virus may be being preserved in the air and be infective for longer and that may play a role. But otherwise I, I tell people, you know, don't, don't increase your thermostat by a few degrees thinking that you're safe. That's not the thing to do. Um, now humidity, um, we think it plays a role because, you know, so you exhale these aerosols, which as we said, is, is this ball of saliva and respiratory fluid that has sodium chloride, mucin, or other components and, and a few viruses and they are, you know, floating in the air, around the air. And now if you expose this to a high humidity environment, it's gonna swell and pick up water. In a dry environment, it's gonna lose the water and become this clump of dried stuff, right? kind of like like the, the mucus in your nose, right? That, that type of phenomenology, but in a much smaller... Uh, now, the, the virus is, is relatively delicate. These, these viruses are not hardy like some bacteria, you know, and, and they can be destroyed relatively easily. So, so for example, if, if this aerosol is drying and during the drying, you're forming some crystals that may break the virus, or on the other hand, that may protect the virus, you know. So now that's kind of the general, or, or it may, you know, some chemical reactions that destroy the virus may be faster in one situation than the other. So that's kind of the general reason why we think humidity plays a role now. Exactly how, you know, there is some results that say low humidity is bad for the virus. I, and, and there are others that say low humidity is good for the virus. And I'm on the second camp. I mean, we, we published a, a study with some colleagues from Argentina and, and what we found is that when you had a dry spell in Buenos Aires, nine days later, like clockwork, you had more cases. And if you had a humid period, nine days later, you had less cases. And it was going up and down and up and down, the humidity and the cases were just following, you know? So um, um, to me, it seems pretty clear in the real world, uh, being in a very dry environment is a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, some people hear this and say, oh, should I buy a humidifier? And I tell them, no, don't buy a humidifier. If you buy a humidifier, what you are saying, I'm gonna leave the virus in the air if it's there, and I'm gonna try to kill it faster, to deactivate it faster. Say, so if you're gonna buy at the end a machine that costs money that you plug in the world, they have to maintain, buy a filter that just removes the virus from the air, mm -hmm. you know, rather than leave it there floating and trying to deactivate it, right? Mm, okay, thank you. Yes, very um, sort of complex things to consider. So our environment clearly plays a major role in aerosol transmission. Um, can you please explain the behavior of the aerosol when it's indoors versus the aerosol's behavior in an outdoor environment? 
Yeah, so the, and that, that's a great question. And we know one of the clearest things in, of the pandemic is that um, there is much more transmission indoors than outdoors. About 20 times more is the estimate, right, from, from different studies. And we know this from very early in the pandemic. There was a study in Japan very early on, and they, they saw this. They follow people who had met with people indoors and outdoors, and it was 20 times more likely to infect someone indoors, right? Now, people talk at the same distance indoor and outdoor, even they talk a little closer outdoors because they, you don't have the ceiling. So people feel a little you know, more comfortable getting closer. So it's not that there are, you know, and, and these droplets, these projectiles are gonna come, in, come out indoor and outdoor, whatever, just the same. In fact, outdoors people may have to talk louder because there may be cars, so maybe more droplets, right? So if it was these droplets or the surfaces, you know, you, you would expect that transmission would be the same indoor and outdoors, but we see that it's 20 times less. This is an indoor pandemic, and this can only be explained by the aerosols, right? Because indoors, you know, the, the air moves about 10 times more slowly, even though, you know, many days outdoors, you don't feel the motion of the air, it's still moving faster, and you can experiment with the smoke, you know, for example. Or, and, and, in, and indoors, on top of that, is, you know, the air may, you know, the smoke may be, you know, at the beginning dissipated, but then if you are in this box, which is the room, which is poorly ventilated, it will accumulate. Just like if you're in the room with a smoker, if you're closed, you are smelling the smoke immediately. If you're on the other side of, the, of a large room, at the beginning you see the smoke, but you don't smell it. But after 10, 20 minutes, you smell it, right? And, you know, because the aerosol is trapped, but if you're at the same distance of someone outdoors, you know, unless you are really unlucky with the wind direction, you know, you see the smoke and you see the smoke and it never gets to you because, the outdoors is used so much larger. You have, I mean, we said the, the key error of the pandemic of this droplet dogma is confusing gravity with dilution, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, and really dilution is what explains the indoor outdoor and, and not gravity, right? So then, um, sorry, and I forgot what was, you were going somewhere else with this mm -hmm. question. Well, um, I think I just wanted, I, I think where I'm going with that question is that uh, when we're outdoors, you've you've um, co you've correctly said that um, transmission is twenty times higher indoors than outdoors, um, and 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 you've said because of the the way the aerosols behave that we don't have as much air movement indoors, and so they're suspended in the air as we're producing them, and then whoever's infected and contagious it, uh, is um, allowing the uninfected and non-contagious to, br to breathe in that contagious virus and become infected in an indoor environment. When we're outside, the air blows the virus away and I guess the ultraviolet violet light from the sun kills it. So um, am, am I correct in, in saying that? Um, not quite, I would say. I would say that when we're outdoors, it's mostly dilution. So basically there is more horizontal wind that's gonna take the virus away and dilute it. And also you don't have a ceiling, right? Mm. Many times what we exhale, you know, in places like, like where you live in Canada or here, most of the time we are exhaling air at, you know, 37 degrees C, something like that. And the air around you is at <clears throat> 10 or 20 or zero. So the, this air that we're exhaling is warmer and it rises. But if you are in a room, it hits the ceiling and then it comes back. Mm. If you are outdoors, it, it keeps going basically and it gets very diluted. So it's mostly dilution. Now the UV light of the sun, it can deactivate the virus, it can kill the virus, but it's not fast enough in general because even under full sun, it takes a few minutes. And under most conditions, you know, in the, like now the, the evening or the morning or, or a cloudy day, it really takes half an hour in many places, you know. So then, you know, if you are with some smoker and then they exhale some smoke a few minutes later or half an hour later, where is that smoke? It's, it's just not, not that relevant because after, you know, it's really, it will have to be a much more intense UV light that, to kill the virus in seconds, but that's not, that's not, that would be very harmful for us, you know. So do we need to wear masks outside when we're outside? In, in periods of high transmission or for people who want to protect themselves because they are at risk or they want to be cautious, we need to wear masks outside in one situation, which is when we are close talking to someone, right? Because that's the situation in which you can imagine you're talking to a smoker, you can still, you know, you're close talking to someone for a while, you can still inhale quite a bit of smoke depending the way the air is moving, right? Now, if you're at a distance, if you are hiking, if you are skiing, you know, I mean, not except maybe your skin, let's say when you go in the chair or when you go in the, 
I mean, I have a, a cousin who got infected in, in one of these cabins, you know, was, that was close going skiing, right? Mm. Um, so so there, there are the periods when you are sharing the air when you're close to others, that's when we need to wear the mask. Now, when, when uh, many times in many, many governments have had rules to say, you have to wear masks everywhere, indoors and outdoors. And, you know, we are as scientists understanding, well, it's, it's more nuanced, like I just explained, but when we talk to public health people, what they tell us is, well, yeah, you are technically correct, but you know, you in public health for the overall public, you cannot give them complex instructions about many things, Ma for masks, all these things, for ventilation, all these things, for washing your hands, all these things, because it's too much and then people don't do it or don't do it well. So they say, you know, so what we tell them is that, and, and if you tell people, okay, you have to put the mask on when, you've, when you, you're when you walking on the street, now you meet someone, now put your mask on, then take it off. The, People don't remember to do that. So you just tell them to wear it at all times. And then if they encounter someone that's not talking, they're wearing the mask, right? Mm, very good point. Thank you for that. Um, due to the difficulty in capturing tiny aerosols that contain viable virus, the scientific community does not have consensus that SARS-CoV-2 is airborne. Could you please explain why it is challenging to capture and measure aerosols containing the coronavirus? Um, because basically a very small amount of virus in an invisible aerosol is enough to infect, basically. I mean, uh, we said the virus is tiny and you need a relatively small amount. I mean, there's debate exactly how many copies of the virus, but maybe 10, maybe 100, that you need to inhale, which is a minute amount of material that you need to inhale and that can get you infected. It's hard to detect that in the air. You know, it's like, so the, there can be a very small amount that's difficult to detect by scientific techniques, and it can still be infective, you know? And especially because as we know, uh, there is another aspect, which is that the, the disease is very variable. Not everybody who has COVID is infected. We know many people, you know, they get infected, the husband gets infected and they're at home and the wife doesn't get infected or whatever, you know, it's like, and, and there are many studies that show many people don't exhale any virus, you know? They, they measure the air that they're exhaling and they don't detect any virus, but other people exhale very large amounts of virus, hundreds of thousands of viruses, virus copies per hour, right? So, so then you, when you do experiments, you have to be lucky that you catch someone who is a high emitter and also people only exhale a lot of virus during a short period of time before they have symptoms when you don't know who they are, you know, so that when you go to a hospital to measure the virus, it's not the best place to do it. But that, that said, there have, been, there have been already many publications where people have found the virus in the air, an infective virus in the air. There is, there is virus that, um, that then they put in some cells and the virus is able to infect the cells. You know? One other thing, I guess I should say, in terms of this, this later part of the infectivity is that when you sample the virus, you know, so you have, to, you have these balls that float in the air and you have to take it out of the air. And, and often this is done by shooting a jet of air against the surface. That's what we call an impactor. Because then basically this, these balls cannot make the bend and then they impact the surface. But that process is very violent for the virus, right? And it may, it may destroy it, right? So, so, and basically all the old methods use that type of technique. And so we have now pathogens like tuberculosis and measles that everybody agrees they go through the air never in the history of medicine has anyone succeeded at, you know, sampling room air where tuberculosis patients were and put that on cells and manage to infect cells or, or with measles is the same thing, right? While we know that when that, that same air was, was piped to guinea pigs, it was able to get them infected. So is, there is this, you know, it's, it's the, the air is big and the variability is large and it's just a difficult problem. Now there are there are some more recent developments during the pandemic. People have developed now some other instruments that are much, much more gentle and they preserve the virus. And that's really how we have, uh, people have achieved those demonstrations, but, but it is a difficult problem. Um, and, and reading your papers, um, there's been um, virus found in, in hospital vents and air ducts that could only have got there if, 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 if through aerosols. And there's been the kind of guinea pig experiment done with SARS-CoV-2 and another animal, I believe. 
uh, where um, one, one set of animals was contagious and infected, the other set of animals wasn't, and they used a tube so that they breathed the same air and the second cage became infected, proving that it was aerosol. Am I correct in that? You are correct. It's, it's been done with ferrets and it has been done with hamsters and I believe also with certain types of monkeys. So it, it has been demonstrated in that way. Yeah, I mean, and those are all, I think, I mean, that's all it took for tuberculosis to be accepted, right? It was an experiment with animals. However, you know, during the pandemic, we've been told, you know, by, by a lot of these public health people that animal experiments are not relevant because they are not human. Yet they were relevant somehow for tuberculosis that was accepted based on animal experiments. And, and I mean, in that paper in the Lancet that you mentioned, it was just not, you know, if you only had the evidence of the animals, you say, oh, maybe, but we have the animals, we have the indoor outdoor difference, we have super spreading events, we have, um, you know, so many, like the fact that we have captured viable virus from the air, you know, the, the, the fact that there are really no arguments against it, against airborne transmission, the fact that we have transmission of people without symptoms that are not coughing and are not producing many droplets. We have transmission at a long distance, you know. People, for example, who are in a quarantine hotel in New Zealand and they are in different rooms and they basically never have any contact, but the air of one room goes under the door and then goes under the door of the other room and gets three people infected. That has been published in a CDC journal, right? Is, and then once you start looking at everything, all the evidence, and you see that it's coherent, and the only way you can explain all the observations together is that transmission through the air is what's important. So I think that really um, you set the stage for answering the question that you wanted to uh, kind of answer earlier in the program. I mean, it's for me um, and lots of other um, medics, you know, the evidence base for SARS-CoV-2 being airborne is categorically correct and therefore all to see. Um, so why isn't this um, uh, scientific evidence being accepted? So that's that's a million dollar question, but I would say, and I, I can give you my approximation. I, I have thought a lot about that question because I've been puzzled by the resistance. Certainly in the pandemic, you know, I thought, you know, once we explain to people uh, on Twitter or on papers or whatever, what's going on, they, then they will understand. And, and um, but that hasn't happened. The resistance continues in many places, right? We've convinced some people or some people have accepted it, but many have not. Uh, even though it's now on the WHO webpage, they say it's airborne, but, but still many, many other public health agencies don't accept it. And, and many, many maybe will accept it and will put it on the webpage, but then they won't promote the measures, the masks, the ventilation, whatever, that go along with that acceptance, right? So they take an intermediate position. So why is that? I think there is, there are two reasons or two families of reasons, right? One is scientific or scientific sociology and history, and the other one is political. And, they, and these two reasons are kind of reinforcing each other, right? So the, the scientific reason has to do with what, what I've mentioned earlier in the program. So there was an error and people, you know, good faith scientists really believe this was a droplet disease because it behaved like the flu, which they thought was a droplet disease. And it's true that early on it behaved like the flu. The problem is that the flu is also airborne. And that's also something that they had rejected for the same reasons, right? So, so then, so there was this, this error that, as I mentioned, comes from 1910. And, um, and this error is, is worth reviewing the history briefly. Why could it, that error get so ingrained? And it really has to, we have to go back to 2,500 years ago. Uh, Hippocrates in ancient Greece, I mean, basically they, he came up with the theory of miasmas. They said when, when a lot of people are getting infected at the same time with the same disease, it must really be the air because it's what we have most in common, right? And so he put forward that hypothesis. And so then basically for two, cent, two millennia, basically humankind thought we were getting infected through the air. And that was the dominant, there were other theories, but that was the dominant theory, right? And we get to 1850, not that long ago, less than two centuries ago, and it's still that was the dominant theory, was the, the miasmas, right? And that was very scary. You know, you could get uh, tuberculosis or something just by breathing it in. There was little you could do to defend yourself. It was also kind of phantasmagorical. They didn't understand delusion, right? It's not, it's not that you are breathing the air coming out of another person, but the disease may come from, from putrid matter miles away, and then you get infected. And, 
you know, so um, chip in, in, in 1910, uh, things is more uh, contact transmission is, is when we are close to someone or when we touch and that's when we get infected and and he comes at the right time because I was saying until 98 until the 1850s it was really the miasmas were dominant but then in the 1850s John Snow shows that cholera which was thought to transmit through the air really transmits through water right and then Ignat Semmelweis in, in Vienna shows that uh, purpura fever um, that was thought to transmit through the air is transmitted through hands. And if you wash your hands, the cases go down. And then later in the 1890s, there's other scientists that showed that malaria, and malaria, malaria is bad air in Italian. It had always been thought to be bad air. And then they show, no, no, it's not the air, it's mosquitoes, right? So now, so, so we had thought for millennia that it was, it was the air. And then suddenly <clears throat> all these big diseases that, that are, you know, kill a lot of people are shown well. It's, so then there is the, you know, people wonder, well, it's, was this, was the era superstition all along and really is not important, right? And and there was a fluid period, but Chapin, who was someone very respected, says, you know, the era doesn't happen. That was, that was a superstition. We should accept progress and germ theory and, and really is contact. is when we touch other people or these spray droplets that fall to the ground, whatever. And, and he is too successful, you know? People, you know, he's he's taken a, he's taken as progress. You know, people are tired of the air that you cannot defend yourself, and and he's successful because distance reduces disease transmission, and so that's washing our hands for some diseases, whatever, whatever. So that becomes a dogma, right? And and now, you know, during the 20th century, basically there is a resistance, and even since the 30s, William Wells and other researchers were trying to show that diseases like tuberculosis and measles were airborne. But they were considered droplet diseases, right? And and for decades and decades, you know, measles, which now is used as a prototypical urban disease, it was accepted in 1985 after seven decades of telling us it was a droplet disease. So this wasn't this wasn't easy to demonstrate, and they were not eager to accept it. And there, there is even a paper on smallpox. There was a there was a clear airborne outbreak, where basically someone in a hospital infected all these other people that were in other rooms. And when you put the smoke in the room of the infected person, it went to the rooms of the people who got infected. So it was clear it was to the air. And there is a report from that basically done in collaboration with WHO that says, you know, we look at the other possibilities, whether it was surfaces or droplets, and, and it was impossible. So then we got to airborne transmission with the inhalation of aerosols, which it was a possibility against which all the investigators were prejudiced. So they, they admitted that was that was the mood throughout the 20th century that airborne is something very unlikely, you know, and coming and, and that propagates all the way to 2020. You know, when the pandemic starts and the WHO starts a committee, and in that committee there are zero experts on airborne transmission, but six experts on hand washing, that comes, that's the history, right? Now, those people who were very prominent and you know and <clears throat> made an enormous error. You know, they said in, in March of 2020 that saying that, that the disease was airborne was misinformation. Now they said that what, what was misinformation is actually the main mode of transmission. Mm -hmm. And the things that work for that main mode of transmission, which are masks and ventilation, whatever, we were not told they were important until much, much later, for example, by WHO, right? So that error that certain people made in public health and infectious diseases, has led to a lot of deaths and economic losses and whatever, whatever. Now, mm, some of those people have accepted it. Some, some do not want to. And I've been told by one of them in private that we need to find a way that we can accept this and we can save face. So it's not like he doesn't disagree that we're right. It's just he wants to save face, right? And WHO is, is a little bit on, on that department. You know, they will put it on the web page because it would be scientifically embarrassing not to accept it, but then they don't say it. If you search the Twitter feed of WHO for the word airborne, it's not there, basically, in, in the last two years. So, so that's one reason, I think, is there was this enormous error that was a good faith error at the beginning, but then it has, it has turned into into really res not wanting to admit that you were wrong and that and that your error caused a lot of a lot of death and, and economic damage and, and disease. Um, the other reason I think is political, right? Because that alone <clears throat> wouldn't be enough, right? If um, if for example we were saying, well, it's transmitted through through water or something that was easier to control. Let's just filter the water. You, the governments will have jumped 
at that and will have say, oh, this is so much easier to do than, than all these other things we're doing, right? But what we're telling governments is more difficult to do. Governments love the droplets and the surfaces. Why? Because, you know, if you're getting infected because you're basically not washing your hands enough and you're touching your face, or because you're not keeping your distance, right? <clears throat> that kind of thing. If you get infected, it's your fault. You didn't wash your hands, you didn't keep your distance. It's all your individual responsibility. So the governments can tell people what to do, but they, the governments, don't have to do so much, right? On the other hand, if you get infected by breathing air that has the virus in a school, in a government building, in a company, now you as a student or as a teacher in the school, you don't have the power to clean that air and remove the virus from the air. That's a responsibility of the school, of the government, of the company. And that's something that, that I mean, costs some money and, and, and then you have to take the responsibility. If you don't do it, then you are liable, for example, in the US for not having done it. You know, people can sue you and things like that. So I think that's that's something that's a very important reason why they they keep us as we yeah I mean that, that, that they don't want to admit it clearly and they, that they want to keep keep saying even though when it has been so clear and with Omicron and it's just so transmissible you know how could you how could anyone believe that that's still the surfaces and the droplets especially when everyone is so paranoid about you know uh, hydroalcoholic gel and all that you know. I think what you said is so critical and, and I think um, it, two things have been brought to mind. Um, I think the way we're taught science um, needs to be reformed. Um, uh, the, yes, I, you know, I, I had to do physics and maths to get into medical school in the UK. Well, I chose to do physics and maths and chemistry and then and did a, a GCSE in biology to get into um, medical school. And so when I read your papers, I mean, I accepted that SARS-CoV-2 was airborne around about sometime in 2020 anyway, because I was reading research about it and I could understand and conceptualize the physics that you're talking about because I'd had that education in school. I think at the moment, the sciences are too siloed. Um, um, it's a, it's a infectious disease um, specialist should know about physics since we're producing aerosols which behave and, and, uh, and obey the laws of physics. Um, and, and then the World Health Organization wouldn't have had a committee that was complete, that had not a single aerosol scientist sitting on it when that's our, the major form of trans, transmission. Um, the second thing with regards to um, the political perspective, um, I think they, I think a lot of people in politics expected the pandemic to be over within a year or two or less. And, and now this virus is here to stay. And, um, and really, we need to adopt um, the discoveries that people like yourselves have made because millions are dying. Um, I think we've had a hundred million, I, I can't remember my own figures, but a hundred million people infected um, with the Omicron variant. And there's more variants to come because nearly 50% of the world's population is unvaccinated. So we now have a degree of urgency in accepting um, the scientific evidence so that we can all protect ourselves against ever getting infected. And if you listen to um, our episode on long COVID, even um, uh, Professor Banerjee showed in one of his research papers that even one infection from SARS-CoV-2 can lead to one or multiple organs being damaged. So, um, you know, we need to adopt the science and, and, and thank you so much for persevering, coming on this program and, and, and many others and continuing to educate us of this. Yeah, and if I, if I may comment on those two issues, I mean, you were talking about the, um, the education of, of, of the doctors. And, and <clears throat> I mean, I think this is one way. I mean, at the end, as I said, this was an error in physics, confusing dilution with gravity made by people who don't study physics very much and, 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 and had a hard time understanding. But I think the other thing, so you, so you could say, well, they should study some physics and that would be one way to do it. The other way is through collaboration, which is a way the way a lot of people do. You know, doctors have to study so many things that now you have physics and, and it's something so foreign and whatever. Is, is that the best way? Another way is just to, to collaborate with people who know that stuff and have an interest, like, you know, people like, like myself and many others, are social scientists, or, or with whoever relevant physical scientists, building scientists, ventilation experts, engineers, 
you know, there is, there's different type of people and we are more than happy to help. But uh, as I said, I mean, it's been very unfortunate that, for example, in, I mean, we faced a lot of resistance early on trying to get the message out and the, the journalists wouldn't talk to us because they thought we were like the 5G people. It's like, oh, these urban people are some conspiracy theorists. And then we finally had that, that letter to WHO in July 6th. And then we got finally a lot of press coverage and suddenly it seems that a lot of journalists were like, oh, these guys are for real and they started doing interviews and WHO was very upset about that and there is one of WHO scientists in this panel who's who basically said I think like the quote was like these people are chemists engineers owners of ventilation companies and they don't really understand infectious disease and I mean despite the fact that there were like 40 or 60 signatories to the letter who were infectious disease people but but also but kind of saying, establishing again, these dichotomies, like we are the doctors, we know, you guys are inferior and you don't know. And, and that's, that's really the drama, that there wasn't a, a possibility for both fields of knowledge to, to contribute, right? I mean, there is a diagram that sometimes I use in the presentation, I say anything that's happening inside of the body, whether it be, you know, antibodies, vaccines, organ damage, whatever, I mean, I don't, I don't go there. That's something for doctors or, or you know, people who study biology or virology to intervene. But once things go out in the physical world and they're flying around and you need to breathe them or they need to interact physically, then physics is part of the equation. And that's not something that should be medical supremacy that the doctors basically, what, what do they do? They, they look at empirical patterns of transmission, things like with distance or we put this mask and there is more or less transmission, but those things are very crude. And they don't look at the mechanism of, of what's going on. And they don't make use of a huge amount of knowledge that we have about how air moves, how the viruses behave, how the aerosols behave, all of these things. So that's, that's really the sad thing. And that hasn't really changed significantly. To this day, you know, WHO, that committee continues to not have anyone who's not a scientist to my knowledge. When, you know, for a disease that's airborne, half the committee should be people with airborne expertise, you know? Um, and the same is true, you know, in, I think in, in the CDC or in the British Columbia or in many places, we are in the same situation that we're still in this medical supremacy and, and they're still telling us that, that we are just unqualified. It's not like we, it's not like, you know, we're having a debate of equals and, and they have more argument. No, 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 we are unqualified to participate and the things we say are not acceptable evidence. That's, that's kind of what's what's bad. Now, on, on the second thing where you say um, we, we need to, to do it and we need to accept it. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I mean, early on, I was thinking, you know, we there is a landslide and the, the evidence is accumulating and it's so much that WHO is going to is gonna fold and it's going to say it's airborne. And But to this day, they haven't. I mean, they, they have put it in the web page quietly and, and the same for a lot of other um, public health authorities, the majority of them worldwide, haven't accepted it clearly and haven't, haven't um, acted on it, right? And uh, when, when is there more interest and when there's more pressure for change, when there is a wave, you know? So at some point, you know, we thought the pandemic was over and then there was the alpha variant and so maybe they, and then there was more pressure and we made some progress, but then it went down and then, um, and we were told, for example, by, from our regional government in Spain, that they were waiting for the pandemic to be, the, to be over because they didn't want to do anything about ventilation. They, and they told us privately, just, you know, and then the Delta wave came and there was more attention and we made some more progress and then it, it waned or it was kind of waning and then Omicron came and then we, that's when uh, WHO finally accepted it and put it in the webpage because, you know, Omicron was so contagious that it was just so embarrassing to keep denying it, you know. But still now we're going down. And uh, in these periods, you know, uh, there are many fewer articles, interviews. Now we have a war in Ukraine and other things that, you know, are important and people are, are worried about. And, and the, these details of the transmission recede into, into the background. And we still have this power structure of the medical people, you know, being the infectious disease and public health people being in absolute control and systematically excluding people from other disciplines. So that, that, that problem persists to different degrees in different places, but that's, that will continue to be a problem. Now, I, um, we, we, we'll see, I mean, it, it varies depending on, on the location and, and um, but I, you know, I mean, what I, at the beginning, I thought we were running a sprint, you know, that I, that I was working 
like crazy on this topic and we were going to publish some early papers and we were going to really convince people because the evidence was so clear and the evidence was so clear and we published the papers but now i realize that's not enough because if, if you if you feel qualified to ignore the papers the fact that the papers are there doesn't mean anything right so i think now we are in a marathon we have to keep working both scientifically and through communication as you're doing and try to reach out to more people we have really reached out to a lot of people and my impression is in the medical profession in general more people are in agreement that this is airborne but the key disciplines that have the decision power infection control and public health those are where the core of the resistance is so we kind of we need to keep working and um, at some point we, we were being asked uh, to make suggestions for the white house about what uh, what do we recommend you know to address this issue you know so recommended all the use ventilation, filtration, better masks, whatever. But one, one thing I wrote in that, in that report as a suggestion was like, we really need interdisciplinary research where there is basically research funding that you can only get if you have doctors and infectious disease people and public health and engineers and also scientists, or whatever. And, and they have to do joint projects because these people need to know each other. Basically this, these silos were really, you know, nobody knew who each other was, you know. And, you know, so when people like me went into the New York Times and said that, that these infectious people, the infectious disease doctors are like, who's this guy? He has no credibility. He's, you know, and, and, and there was no one I could reach out personally, you know, that was sitting in the WHO committee who knew me from working together for 10 years. You know, I reached out to people, but there was some, you know, some scientists in Colorado who doesn't seem to have worked in disease transmission or whatever. So powerful, Jose. So powerful what you've just said. And um, again, I'm repeating myself, you know, um, it, it's such a shame that there is this hierarchy that you're talking about um, of, of one element um, and, and, and unfortunately in the medical profession who are looking down on, on, on the likes of, of, of you who are, who are highly respected in your field and, and have part of the solution of us getting out of this pandemic. Um, not every medic thinks that way. I'm a medic that doesn't. And the whole point of this program is to get the information out there. And, not, and as I said earlier, knowledge is power. And if people understand how this virus is transmitted, understand what we need to do in order to get back to some form of pre-COVID life, which is to adopt ventilation, filtration techniques, masking, etc., which you're going to talk about, um, then we can live safely with this coronavirus. It isn't going away. I think people are getting that idea now. And we have the propensity of ruining, ruining the next generation, several generations to come, if we allow people to get infected because of the risks of chronic disease to our children, to our unborn children, and, and, and our young working public, never mind everybody else who's immune suppressed, elderly, et cetera. So I think it's critical and urgent that the science that you've um, discovered is adopted, accepted, and, and things happen. Thank you so much for that statement. I know we're coming to, to near the end of time, but this is such a, a powerful, powerful episode. Um, uh, and I really, we all really appreciate um, you know, your contributions um, and your participation in this program. So I'm going to get to the last question because frankly speaking, you've answered all the others. Um, at present, our focus on managing this pandemic is via vaccination. And I agree vaccination is one of, if not the most important risk reduction or mitigation strategy for controlling the spread of the coronavirus. I believe vaccination vaccination alone will not get us out of this pandemic. We need additional risk reduction strategies, working in tandem, creating what I have been calling a 360 degree pandemic management solution. And for the audience, please see the website for a diagram, for a diagram of this solution, um, the kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19, the answers uh, part of the website. On your Twitter feed, you talk of a Swiss cheese approach, which I think is similar. Can you please explain this to the audience? Yeah, I, am, I mean, I agree with, with everything you said. The, the, um, the Swiss cheese analogy, which is not mine, I mean, I, I learned it from Ian McKay, who's an Australian virologist. Um, and I think it existed before. 
Um, the idea is that the Swiss cheese, you know, has holes. So you, you cut a slice and it has some holes, but every slice has different holes, right? And the idea is that, especially if you go indoors and you have um, a bunch of possible things you can do, but none of them is perfect, right? I mean, as you said, the vaccines reduce transmission, reduce severity, but they don't eliminate transmission, right? Um, and then we have masks and we have good masks like N95 and they work very well, but they're not perfect. You can have a leak, it's very difficult to make sure it's a hundred percent, right? And the same is with ventilation or with filtration, you know, there is, they help a lot, but you could be unlucky and or you could be close to someone who's very infective and still get infected, right? So, so the idea is that you do multiple things and then it's like the virus is trying to go through all these layers of Swiss cheese and maybe it goes to the whole of your vaccination, but it hits the mask or it hits the filtration or something like that. So the idea is to, to layer uh, these mitigations and that's that's the correct approach. And, and, it, and it works very well when you do it, right? And which layers and how much of, of the layers, how much ventilation, how much filtration, how good of a mask depends on, on the risk, how many cases are there where you are at that point in time, how severe is the disease, um, you know, as we learn more about long COVID, as you said, how much at risk are you? You know, are you an elderly person? Are you immunosuppressed? Or are you a single parent with four kids and you don't want to risk, you know, not being in their life or, or you know, or whatever reason you, you have, right? Or, um, so so I think that's, that's uh, yeah, the, a very useful. And, and I, I, I don't know your, your, your 360 diagram, but I can, I think I can still do picture it. I think I've, I've seen other ways to do it, but I mean, idea is, is this, that we need, the vaccines alone are not enough. We need more of these, in particular, what they call non-pharmaceutical interventions, things like masks or ventilation or something, which are not some drug or sort of vaccine that you put into your body, it's something we do in the, in the physical world, right? Yes, I mean, the 360 degree solution is part of that. So the way I see it is that we need vaccination. We also need regulator, public health, governmental, financial support. We need environmental changes, which is what you talk about, ventilation, filtration, masking, education. We need um, uh, information technolo technology so that we can um, sort of monitor people when they're contagious, do good contact tracing. We need testing. So if you bring all of these in the circle to varying degrees, you know, so for example, testing would be really important um, to see if it's safe for you to go to school as well as being vaccinated, as well as having ve uh, ventilation and filtration. So you'd have different weighted um, incidences of all of those different things, but collectively we would need a bit of them in order to protect ourselves against the coronavirus. So we have to look at it in more of that whole way. And I think that's very similar to your Swiss cheese analogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a different way to to the diagram. I mean, you, you're also talking more broadly. I was you know, I'm more, more focused on transmissions and thinking of filters and ventilation. And of course, things like you mentioned, you know, testing and isolation and, and all those things and contact tracing are, are really important, right? But it's just, uh, yeah, yeah. So so we need to do all of them because again, yeah, the testing, testing fails some of the time, contact tracing, you are not always successful, but, but when you are successful, you prevent some transmission and then, if you are not successful, then the mask may save you or the vaccine or, you know, it's, it's the sum of everything that keeps us safe. Exactly. So we're reaching the end now. Um, so um, this has been a fantastic um, episode, Jose, and I'm excited to hear um, <coughs> uh, next week's episode with Shannon and Jason. So the next week's episode is SARS-CoV-2 is Airborne, part two. How do we combat it? Thank you for educating us all. And um, uh, let's hope this just gets out there and the, and the public demand what needs to be done. Okay. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of COVID-19 The Answers. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate and review and do visit our website kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19 The Answers. Thank you.